everybody, welcome back to what I watch in quarantine March edition. Wait, did I read that right? I guess it's March? Wow, I've been doing this for an entire year now. Well, I guess time moves fast, I didn't even notice. Well, I guess I have to thank you all for being with me through this journey. This series has done a lot for my channel, so I thank you for those that have been here since the beginning. It really means the world to me, so thank you so much for being supportive of this series. Anyway, I saw a ton of films this month, so let's jump right into it. I started the month off with Bad Education, directed by Corey Finley. I really liked it. This is by far one of the most overlooked films of the past year. This truly blew me away. For only a second directorial feature, this is extremely impressive for Corey Finley. Each shot feels perfectly timed and placed, the shot composition is so nuanced, the color palette is mostly made of a very dark blues to really set the tone. The filmmaking itself just all feels very analog and classical, but distinct and very inspired. This could have easily tried to go the modern route and be like The Wolf of Wall Street or The Big Short or Bombshell and try to play very loud rock music while the characters are stacking money or something like that, but it feels a lot more subtle and relaxed with a lot of the soundtrack consisting of a lot of classical music. It fleshes out scenes to its core to really put you in the shoes of the people on screen. This also uses Hugh Jackman's talent perfectly. He needs to do more films like this, easily his best performance since Prisoners. Alice and Janney also knocked it out of the park as well. Every actor felt extremely natural in this setting, and everyone felt very realistic. I feel like that term realistic is very broad, but I mean it in the best way possible. Everything just feels tangible, and that that's what makes it so much more investing of a watch for me. I was really impressed with the screenplay, the presentation, the editing, the music. This was just a really entertaining piece of filmmaking that really drew me into a topic that I would never normally find interesting. That's the beauty of film. My favorite technical aspect was the makeup and hairstyling. It was insanely detailed to the point where it was borderline uncomfortable to look at. It, it sounds weird, but you know it's true if you've seen it. This movie was incredibly entertaining from beginning to end and it deserves more watches. It's currently on HBO Max if you have a subscription, so I would really recommend checking it out. Follow that up by rewatching Up, directed by Pete Docter. I legitimately forgot how good this film was. As a kid, I always found the first 15 minutes compelling, but the rest of it just kind of whatever. I just kind of turned my brain off for all that stuff when I was like, you know, like eight years old or something. And yes, while the opening 15 minutes are incredible and easily the best part of the film, what follows is one of the most subtle and heartfelt movies that Pixar has ever made. It's never in your face with its emotions or its main message. It's honestly one of the most adult Pixar films, despite it looking like kitty fluff from the outside. It's just a really good movie. More on that soon in my Pixar ranked video that I will be making pretty soon. Then I finally watched Lady Bird, directed by Greta Gerwig. As expected, I loved it. Even though I had a feeling I would love it, I was also kind of skeptical that I would find it kind of overrated and the main character impossible to connect with. And yes, while the main character is kind of a brat, the performance and the writing make it so believable and easy enough to understand that I can somehow relate to this person that I never really had anything in common with despite a few tiny personality traits here and there. I've been wanting to see this ever since it came out and I finally sat through it and honestly, this is maybe the biggest shocker from A24 that I've seen. I saw 8th grade and Moonlight, which were amazing as I expected them to be, Moonlight obviously being much better than 8th grade, and I thought Ladyburg was going to be executed in the same way. Slow, disconnected, and quiet, and while yes, it was disconnected and didn't really have a narrative structure, it moved at such a brisk pace that it was easy enough to digest. I was relieved, I thought this would contain long, dialogue-driven scenes with nice cinematography and Oscar-worthy performances, but this was actually really cute, sad, fast pace, and really honest all at once. This was just a pleasant watch. It was short, it's like an hour and a half, so that really helps, and it was very brutal at the same time. I honestly think this is my favorite A24 film so far, and I'm really excited to check more of their stuff out. I'd say Moonlight is easily their best film, but this is my favorite. Then I rewatched Monsters, Inc. I'll talk about it more in my Pixar video, but yeah, it's exactly how I remember it. Truly awesome, hilarious, creative, and fresh. I just wish I got something out of it that was different. You know what I mean? It was exactly what I expected, and I really like it, you know? Then I checked out 9 to 5, directed by Colin Higgins. You all know the song. Working nine to five. But did you know, the movie 
is actually great. This was such a pleasant surprise. This looked like another Steel Magnolias, which I saw right when the series was just starting up. That movie was fine, but it wasn't the most interesting emotionally and had really inconsistent pacing and tonal problems. I still really like Steel Magnolias, but it's not one that I've thought about a ton since I saw it. 9 to 5 totally won me over. It's funny, it's likable, and it's insanely relevant, and I'm surprised it holds up as well as it does. It basically touches on a woman's place in the workplace. Instead of objectifying the characters or making them insanely perfect and emotionless, they're funny, they're likable, they're fun to be around. I would love to sit down and just hang out with these characters, and this helps make this absurd concept all the more entertaining to watch. It's just really lively and fun. The way everything escalates and intensifies is such a treat to watch. I wish we got confident, well-made, and original movies like this these days. It's not doing anything insane, it's not doing anything dramatic, it's not some comedic masterpiece, it's just fun. I didn't think I'd say this, but I kinda wanna see it again. It was that good. Do yourself a favor and check this one out. It's one of the most entertaining films I've seen in a long time. Then I saw the WandaVision finale, and y'all know how I feel about that. And I rewatched Guardians of the Galaxy, directed by James Gunn. Believe it or not, I actually love this one. I used to just really like it, but considered it a little overhyped and not that funny. It's still not the funniest thing on the planet, and may not even be the funniest MCU movie, but the charm and lovability of all the characters on screen make me forgive some of the jokes that don't fully land. While I don't think this is quite as good as its sequel, it's still an insanely fun time and by far the most ambitious thing that Marvel has done so far. The tone is executed perfectly and it's to this day one of my favorite comic book movies out there. I can gladly say that the Guardians movies are my favorite part of the MCU now. What a creative and amusing part of this massive universe. Top 5 MCU movies for sure. Then I rewatched Spider-Man Homecoming directed by John Watts. This is not really the best thing in the world guys, like, chill. I enjoy it for sure, and Tom Holland was a great casting choice, Michael Keaton was great as always as Birdman, the high school stuff is cute and personal, I'm glad something like this exists. A problem is the action in the movie. This has some generic action sequences with really dull direction. That's something Far From Home at least improved on. Say what you want about the Raimi films, but at least those action scenes had flair and something that made it stand out. They felt distinct. They were kinetic and they had this pizzazz. These sequences just felt like Marvel action and doesn't entirely work for me. I also don't like how Peter doesn't really learn much in the movie, but I'm not gonna go into that stuff, you know what I mean. I like this one a lot, but I think there's too much average stuff in it for me to really love it, you know? Then I watched Chef, directed by John Favreau. It was delightful. It's such a simple and straightforward story about a man who has a passion for cooking and wants to share that with others, while having an emotional core about family. It's wholesome, but not the manipulative kind. The movie gave me joy, but it never got, like, sentimental on me. It was just pure organic happiness. You can't really describe it. This is exactly what I needed. I also love how it stars a bunch of A-list actors, but they're not doing anything insanely dramatic or, you know, action-y. They're in their natural state. They're just being themselves. It's just really cool to see celebrities that they're able to make their own movies where they can just be chill and not worry about creative control because they're already so high at the top that they don't really have to worry about that stuff. If I wanted to make a movie for fun one day, this is the kind of movie I'd make. Chill, breezy, fun, heartwarming, you know, all the good stuff. Then we watched Still Alice starring Julianne Moore, much better than I expected. These types of biopics are usually not really for me, but unlike those films, this one isn't sappy, repetitive, or fake. This one truly feels authentic and always feels fascinating to me. I always felt invested in every single scene. I think most of it is due to Julianne Moore giving the best performance of her career from what I've seen so far. Sometimes people say an actor carried a film, and I usually take that term for granted. Sometimes I write it off as basic film criticism, but I without a doubt believe that Julianne Moore carries this film all the way to the end. It also helps that Kristen Stewart and Alec Baldwin are also fantastic as supporting actors. And it always helps that the direction is very character oriented and it's purposely trying to feel made up of fragments and individual scenes that leave giant holes in between those previous scenes to really make you feel disoriented and confused to purposely get you in the mind space of Alice. This movie was also, you know, very depressing, but in all the good ways, you know. I just felt the weight of everything. And again, I have to give all the credit in the world for Julie 
in more to pull something like this off. You know, a beautiful film that I probably won't ever watch again, but I greatly appreciated it. It's not the most memorable thing in the world, and I'm gonna assume that something like The Father does something like this much better, but I'll have to see. I'm kind of excited to watch that one, actually. Then I rewatched Wally. -E. This is by far Pixar's most epic film. It feels massive. The story is ambitious. The power and the drive that this has is extremely effective. But in the center of it all, you have an, a really endearing story about a robot who possesses human qualities. It's uplifting in all the best ways because it shows that we can just be as optimistic and loving as this random robot. It's a robot, but it's got the biggest heart, and that's why it works so well. Again, I'm going to touch on this more in my Pixar video, but yeah. I love this, and it holds up super well. Then I saw Crazy Stupid Love again. I really don't think this has any right being as funny or pleasant as it is, but you know, it just is. The writing is sharp, it's hilarious, the dramatic beats land somehow, it's romantic, it's got so much of what I love about movies despite the filmmaking being really mediocre. I still think the babysitter plotline could have easily been cut out of this mostly straightforward accessible rom-com because it was honestly really gross to me and it doesn't really fit with everything else. Besides those things, I actually really love this movie for some reason. As you know, I've got major crushes on Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling for obvious reasons, so they were easily my favorite part of the movie. Then I saw Bridge of Spies directed by Steven Spielberg. With Spielberg being my favorite filmmaker of all time, I had pretty high expectations for this movie. I thought it was going to be a really intriguing espionage thriller with great performances and cinematography, and it was all around fine. One thing I found particularly exceptional about the film was Spielberg's use of blocking, dolly pushins, and character isolated camera movement. It all helped to add a lot of drama to the sequences on display. Unfortunately, I didn't really connect to the story or like anything happening on screen. It's not entirely the movie's fault, I guess. That's just me not really caring that much. I tried to get in, but I never really found it that compelling, unfortunately. There's not really an emotional hook to really draw me in, so I always felt like I was an outsider. I was left outside in the cold, and the film didn't really open the door to let me in, so I was just wet by the end. This seemed like it was for me, and it really wasn't, and that's okay. It doesn't really offend or bother me in any way. I just don't really care about it that much. Sorry, y'all. Then I saw Cherry, directed by the Russo brothers. I kind of hated this one. I don't like saying that about movies, but this just rubbed me in all the wrong ways. It was tonally inappropriate, the emotional interior was really off, and the direction, oh my gosh, the direction was way too much. I think the Russo brothers were too obsessed with making the direction absolutely everything at once, that it's just overbearing and kind of pretentious. The movie is just so insane, but also inconsistent. The Russos clearly have a talent and an eye, and I think the film is unique and interesting, but it isn't one that I would ever, ever watch again. It's hard to explain, but it's just uncomfortable in all the wrong ways. The best takeaway is that Tom Holland is going to be around for a while, because he shows a lot of promise with this performance. It's not a necessarily great performance, it's not even his best in my opinion, but he really shows dedication, and that's always a good thing. This one just really rubbed me in the wrong way, and I did not really enjoy a single minute of it. Then I rewatched my favorite movie of all time, The Shawshank Redemption. I really cannot put this one into words. I was afraid I wouldn't like it as much seeing it again because I hadn't seen it in almost a year and a half. Maybe I would find it cheesy and predictable. Maybe I would find the editing choices jarring. Maybe I don't know why I would have not had an emotional connection to it. I was honestly afraid I wouldn't have enjoyed it as much, but I needed to have been. Because not only do I consider this my favorite movie of all time, I also consider it the best movie of all time. Something I found fascinating was the humility of the filmmaking. They got the literal Roger Deakins to lens the film, and it's not even flashy or some visually gorgeous work of art. It looks great, don't get me wrong, but he really let the story take the forefront here. The character development feels natural and slowly progresses in a way that's easy to settle with. The main theme doesn't feel jammed down your throat and feels very genuine. The dialogue feels very fluid and thought out, but also authentic and true to the characters delivering them. The movie is hard-edged, but it has a soft spot at its center. This is the most humble movie I've ever seen. I've loved every second of it. The 
two and a half hour runtime just flies by in an instant. Such a beautiful and immersive experience that I will never get tired of. It really made me feel like I was floating off the ground, I swear. I just get lost in this movie. I'm genuinely in love with this film and I don't think I'll ever stop loving it. I saw Arrival directed by Denis Villeneuve. I thought it was really good. I love how it patiently builds its story to really allow you to feel the weight of the situation at hand portrayed excellently in the film. The way they reveal this concept is really slow yet effective. I thought it was a really good setup, but once it gets to the actual pods, the movie just ramps up and gets so much better. Amy Adams is absolutely terrific in the movie and displays a wide array of emotions despite her character not speaking very much. This was a film that drew me in enough so the emotional beats could work and the intensity could be felt. But I was never, like, fully encapsulated in this world as I was with, like, Prisoners, currently the only film I've seen from Villeneuve. It was interesting and really well executed, and I respect the people that call it an all-time favorite. But I personally couldn't entirely get into it, and that's fine. I'm glad you guys love it, but, you know, it's not entirely made for me. Something I really loved, though, was how it's a story about nations coming together through a worldwide attack and how we can be unified through that kind of conflict. It's also a story that involves a lot of people and everything feels massive in scope, but it's still personal. It's a character-driven story and it never loses focus of that. I really appreciate this one in a lot of ways, but it's not one I'm dying to see again. I still really like it though. I'd be down to watch it again, I just, I can't see myself, like, actively going out to watch it again, if that makes sense. Then I rewatched Fruitvale Station and it's still as effective as it was when I first saw it. For those that don't know, I first saw this back in May, I believe. I didn't didn't know much about the film and I came out in tears. It was one of the most, if not the most, emotional experience I've had watching a movie. It was a film that hit me really hard. What hits even harder is the fact that the death of George Floyd happened about a week later. With seeing this film a week before that tragic event, I was able to empathize with the situation a lot more. In that way, this film is really special to me. It drew me into someone's life, capturing their flaws and their gifts and their talents, and naturally makes you care about a human being without you really noticing very much. It's super effective in that way. When this life that you care about is taken away from you, your heart breaks in a way that few films have been able to capture. This movie just makes me feel something, and that's super important. It's not a movie about a shooting or a movie about police brutality. It's a movie about a person and the human spirit and it never loses sight of what it's trying to do. It doesn't use aggression to make its point. It uses human behavior and beautiful moments in time to make its point. And I think that's why it works so well. A lot of movies like this just want to get preachy and aggressive, but this one doesn't really get lost in the politics. It really just cares about the person at hand and really likes to dissect the person. And honestly, this is really impressive coming from Ryan Coogler. This being his first feature film and uh yeah i really love this one and kugler still inspires me to this day i think this is his best film honestly and then i saw the naked gun directed by the dudes who made airplane and of course i enjoyed it with me thinking airplane is the greatest comedy ever made this one landed for me it's not nearly as good but it was a very enjoyable watch and one of those few movies that gets away with slapstick humor not really being that annoying the best parts of this movie are when oj simpson gets shot repeatedly and that's at like the very beginning so <laughs> <clears throat> then I finally got around to watching Ridley Scott's original Blade Runner. I saw the final cut, if you were wondering. I honestly kind of love this one. I thought maybe I'd find it boring and pretentious, but it worked mostly because of the atmosphere it created. The film contains this rare and powerful energy that I can't really describe. This wasn't really an emotional experience, but more of an atmospheric one. The story was intriguing, but the most interesting parts were the world and the characters built inside of said world. It's such a cool concept and it's executed to perfection by Ridley Scott. A lot of you guys may find it downright boring, but I just found it fascinating personally. It's not perfect from a pacing level, but I do think it's pretty much perfect from a filmmaking level. Scott just understands the craft, and he makes this way more beautiful than it has any right to be. I kind of love this movie in a really strange way. I can't exactly describe the emotions I felt watching 
watching it because I don't know if I really felt any emotion watching it. I can say that this is a great movie and even though it gets a lot of love I still think it deserves a lot more praise for its production design. This has some of the best production design I've ever seen in a film and y'all gotta show some respect to the people who put countless hours into building these sets and creating this world. I mean this movie came out in 1982. I mean come on. Like I said the characters are designed to be emotionless robots so you have to learn and navigate around emotional connection to find another way to care about the people on screen. It's difficult but I am actually really interested to rewatch it. I think the beauty of acting is how much emotion you can convey without saying anything at all and this movie kind of breaks that rule by not really giving the characters to show emotion so you have to learn and find different ways to be able to care about the people on screen and somehow I still cared about them in a really weird way. And this is such a strange yet awesome movie and I'm really hyped to see 2049 now. Hopefully that movie's even better. Then I rewatched Jaws. This is, I think, my favorite Steven Spielberg movie. It holds up flawlessly. I mean flawlessly. Yeah, the jump scares work, but the best part of this movie are the human characters. The shark is less of an antagonist and more of a plot device that drives our characters on an adventure where they get to use their personalized skills to work together on a goal. It sounds cheesy, but it's a movie about teamwork and how we can come together to accomplish something. Also, pretty much every character in the movie is memorable, down to the people in the background. So yeah, this is in my top 5 favorite movies of all time easily. I love this film so much. Then I saw Dreamer, starring Dakota Fanning and Kurt Russell. This is one of those horse movies that's super predictable, and there's essentially nothing to talk about. This movie's pretty harmless. It's not great, it's not bad, it's just a perfectly fine family movie that's exactly what you'd expect it to be. I also rewatched Flushed Away, and it's hilarious. This is one of the best DreamWorks movies in my opinion. The sense of humor is really on point. Pacing and the runtime really helped this movie to never really get tedious. It's got this whole misinterpretation and liar revealed stuff, but it never really overstays its welcome, so it works really well in the context of this movie. This was always a childhood favorite and it holds up to this day. I really like this movie. Then I saw The Social Network again, obviously directed by my boy David Fincher. Obviously, I love it. It's got that pristine Fincher-esque look that you can't help but get lost in. Every line delivery feels so polished and satisfying and the energy, oh my gosh, that energy. The movie captures such a rare energy that few films have ever achieved. I can't believe it's as amazing as it is. It's one of the best films and one of the most unique films I've ever seen. We all love it, you know, but sometimes we forget to give it this much credit for how creative and kind of weird it really is from an entertainment level. It's just a really, uh, you know, unique movie. Then I rewatched Titanic again. And you know what, guys? I love this movie. Yeah, it's super cheesy and goofy during the first half, but it's also self-aware enough to make me say that it adds to the charm of it all. The characters are really one note in a lot of ways, and the DiCaprio and Winslet are not really that great in this movie. I don't know why this is their most popular film, because, you know, they've given, like, way better performances than this. Dialogue feels like it came straight out of a Disney movie at points, but you know what? I don't care. The first time I saw this, I started it at like 11.30 with my family, and we were all tired, and I was awake for all three hours. We started it at 10.30 this time, and I was still awake for the entire time despite really being exhausted. This movie is really engaging despite it being really basic from a story point of view. But once that ship hits that iceberg, the movie becomes something else. It's all of a sudden really heartbreaking, terrifying, exciting, with a lot going on. The sinking section of the movie is tedious, but in the best way. It's really long and extended, but it makes it so much more engaging and really gets you to encapsulate yourself into this world. Then I rewatched Silverado, directed by Lawrence Kasten, one of my all-time favorite movies. I don't know if y'all know this, but I'm a huge Western guy. My family loves Westerns, and I love them as well. I love The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly is easily my favorite Western of all time. This is probably my favorite American Western. It's full of energy, lovable character, sharp writing, and a great cast. I swear all of these actors were at their peak and it really showed. This is pretty formulaic, but it stands on its own because Kasten is just such a great and underrated director. This is an overlooked gem in my book, and I think you should all go check it out. It's just, no one ever talks about it. Please give it some attention. Then I saw The Peanut Butter Falcon, and I thought it was really sweet. It was charming, it was likable, the plot was really generic, but it stood well enough on its own. It did give me a lot of Coen Brothers vibes sometimes, but it still felt pretty distinct like its own thing. It had a lot 
lot of heart and the behind the scenes stuff I found the most interesting in all honesty. The way this was made is truly fascinating and pretty heartwarming. So you should go look it up. It's it's an adorable little movie. Really cool stuff. I thought this looked nice, had some bland editing, strange pacing, and great performances from everyone but Dakota Johnson, who I, I didn't really like that much. Zach really stole the show though, and he melted my heart every time he opened his mouth. This was a nice small scale film that I'll probably never watch again, but I really enjoyed it in the moment and I'm glad I saw it. Then I finished everything off with Rocket Man, and you know how I feel about this one. It takes the basic formulaic genre and runs with it in a really fresh way. Similar to the Peanut Butter Falcon, it takes the story that's really generic, but the heart and the unique personality, it's all there. I still can't believe that Taron Edgerton was snubbed for an Oscar. <laughs> <clears throat> how he gave a truly transcendent performance and probably my favorite performance of last year and yep uh that's what i saw this month i know this was long and i know i remind you a lot of carson runquist and i apologize for one of those two things anyway have an awesome day keep watching more movies because they're awesome and i'll catch you later on the next one this is ethan butler and i'm out <laughs>